The Bible says that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. But he has given this to the son of man. Okay? So men have been given dominion. Okay? Men have been given ownership and rulership of this earth. It belongs to men. And the reason I know that is even for the devil to operate on this earth, he still needs a man. For God to operate, he needs a man. For the devil to operate, he needs a man. Okay? Because the rightful and legal ownership on this earth are men. Somebody say amen. amen. And when I say men, I'm not talking about male. I'm talking about mankind. Okay? The Bible says he created them, male and female. When we talk of men, we talk of people, mankind. Male is gender. Men is not gender. Oh, okay. Are we together? Male, female. But God has given representation on the earth to men. Somebody say amen. So if the church is going to do something, we need to become proactive in our administration of the kingdom. We need to stop praying for things like God do something. Because God is waiting for you to do something. Oh, I didn't get an amen. Say amen. amen. God is waiting for you to do something. The Bible is very clear before people are saying, but pastor, what about the sovereignty of God? The Bible says, the Lord says, draw unto me. So you do it first, and then I will do something. So God will respond to our faith and to our actions. So in this month, our theme is talking about represent because we as people have a lifelong mission. Caleb, you can pray for me until we say so, okay? So let's go very quickly to Judges chapter 6. I'll be reading Judges chapter 6 from the message translation before I get into my, my word this morning. I'll be reading Judges chapter 6 from the message translation. Um, I don't know why all of a sudden the message translation has captivated me. But I'm enjoying some of the, the words and teachings from the message translation. Please understand one thing about the message translation. It is a paraphrased um, uh, uh, translation. It, it tries to colloquialize or, or put the teachings of the Bible into modern English. To explain it from your understanding. So you can see unfamiliar words like a tuxedo. When we know Jesus didn't have a tuxedo. Because it's trying to imply the kind of dressing he had. But look at this. The Bible says, yet again, the people of Israel went back to doing evil in God's sight. God put them under the domination of Midian for seven years. Midian overpowered Israel because of Midian. Of Midian overpowered Israel. Because of Midian, the people of Israel made for themselves hideouts in the mountains, caves, and forts. Let's go on. When Israel planted its crops, the Bible then goes on to say, Midian and Amalek and the Easterners would invade them and camp in their fields and destroy their, destroy their crops all the way down to Gaza. They, let nothing, they left nothing for them to live on, uh, neither sheep nor, of, nor ox nor donkey. Let's move on. Bringing their cattle and tents, they came in and took over like an invasion of locusts. And their camels passed counting. They marched in and devastated the country. Let's go on. The people of Israel, reduced to grinding poverty by Midian, cried out to God for help. Free, uh, sorry, for help, right? freed you from, a, I don't know who was typing that, but I think God was saying, then it says, God said, I freed you from a life of slavery. I rescued you from Egypt's brutality. And then from every oppressor, I pushed them out of your way and gave you their land. Let's go next verse. And I said to you, I am God. I am God, your God. Don't for a minute be afraid of the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But you don't listen to me. One day, the angel of the Lord came and sat down under the oak in Ophrah, and that belonged to Joash, the Abizarite, who is the son of Gideon, who, whose son Gideon was threshing wheat 
in the wine press. Now, I want you to pay attention there. Gideon was threshing wheat in the wine press. Out of sight of the Midianites. Let's move on. One time, the people of Israel had cried out to God. <laughs> That's where you put that part. You see that? That should have come in the last part. I'm praying for you guys. Skip, please. Yes, Joseph, that's, that was in the previous verse. You just put it there. Okay? I didn't say go backwards. Let me read from the message translation. Move to the next verse. Move, move, move. Okay? Move. Then the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said, God is with you, almighty warrior. Gideon replied, God is with, with me. Why, master? If God is with us, why has all this happened to us? Where are all the miracle wonders our parents and our grandparents told us about? Doesn't that sound like something that we're going through now? Where is the hand of God that we used to hear about? You know? And didn't God deliver us from Egypt? The fact that God has not, the fact is, God has nothing to do with us. He has turned us over to Midian. Okay? Let's move on. I think we'll end there. Okay? Let's leave it right there. God has nothing with us. He has turned us over to Midian. Let me finish it up from the message translation in the version I have because you can lead me into sin while I'm preaching. Okay? Okay, so verse 15 says, So he said, Oh my Lord, how can I save Israel? Indeed, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. And the Lord said to him, Surely I'll be with you, and you shall defeat the Midianites as one man. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Today I want to teach you or preach from something that I have entitled, Restoring Settings. Restoring Settings. Okay? Um, I don't know who's ever gone through a, a time when your phone which was probably brand new and was a blessing, at some point misbehaved. Um, and at some point, you had to restore it to factory settings. Um, you had to wipe out all your data. Um, sometimes it happens at a critical point. I don't know about you, it's happened to me at a critical point <laughs> where I, I was expecting something important or trying to do something important. And all of a sudden, it's like all the settings in this beautiful device of mine suddenly gave up or caved in. And you have to restore to factory settings. And it's, it's very painful when you don't have a backup. Now, uh, thank God for devices that you can back up. But uh, as I speak here prophetically, I know most of you people don't back up. I sense in the spirit. Most of us don't back up. Now, the, the unfortunate part is this, is that, you know, when, you, when your phone is having challenges, you, you cannot see on the inside. You, you cannot see what's happening. You cannot see where the glitches are coming up. And sometimes there could be a battle inside your device, and, and it's, your, your device is on the losing side, and you are unaware. But at some point, it will cave in, and you either have to reset it, or if it's worst-case scenario, you have to buy another device or change devices. Now, the unfortunate part with life is that life, there is no backup. There is only one life. There is no backup. So you have to manage this very life that you have correctly. You cannot afford to be in a position where you have to uh, you could lose everything, okay? In life, there is no backup. There is no restarting all over. It's not like a video game. You know, in the video games, that used to happen where you'd play a game, and if you passed the stage, it would automatically save you at that point. You know what I mean? Life is not like that. If you die, you die. You know, if you come back, hey, that's a miracle, but you're still going to die. Even if you get resurrected, you don't get a new life. You gotta start. You gotta, you gotta continue from where you left off. So, my admonition to you today is this is that whatever God has given you in your life, manage it correctly. Manage it correctly. Handle your life correctly. We see a story here 
of the children of Israel in, in a town which God had given them. Remember, this is a town that God had given them. This was a blessing that God had given them. But at some point, there was a war that they were unaware of. I want to let the children of God know here that with blessings come enemies. With blessings comes enemies. The Bible says that he prepares a table in the presence of who? Enemies. So if you want to be blessed, you must recognize that on the other side of a blessing is an enemy. And you must be strong to deal with the enemies of your blessing. I also want you to realize that even though God has blessed us with this earth, there is also an adversary on this earth. And the adversary wants to uh, 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 impose his agenda on the earth. So although God has blessed us, you see, it's amazing that the devil does not appear in the book of Genesis until God enthrones man. Until God says, uh, Adam and Eve, you are now in charge. Suddenly in chapter 3, you hear of an adversary. Because with every level, there is a devil. And there is an enemy on the other side of each level. And the enemy knows that where there is a godly person, there will be a godly agenda. And where there are no godly people, there is no neutrality. It means that there is a demonic agenda. This is why it is important for us to pray for leadership. It is important for us to be involved in society. Because where there are no righteous people, we are allowing and we are permitting demonic agendas to be passed through the mediums which we are ignoring. The church for too long has looked away from certain industries. They've said things like you cannot be in media, you cannot be in music, you cannot be in entertainment, you cannot be in politics. But listen to me, when the righteous abscond from these sectors, guess what? You are allowing the enemy to take control. And whoever is in control sets the tempo, sets the temperature for the life that we live. Beloved, that's why it is important that you pray for your leadership. Pray. The Bible tells us as Christians we must pray for leadership. Because if there is no godly or divine guidance at the helm, the Bible is very clear. Whoever your leader is sets the tempo and the precedence for the people. One scripture says this, like priest, like people. Your king matters. And so we must continuously pray for God's agenda to be pushed in the right places. You must pray for schools. You're just leaving education to anyone and anywhere. Do you know who's educating your children? We must pray that we get involved in the right settings. That we get involved in the right places. I want you to understand this. That everything must glorify God. Because our hearts were created to worship God. Our hearts were created to worship. Human beings were created with the capacity to worship. Human beings were created with the ability to worship. Meaning that our hearts must be devoted to God. Somebody say amen. You're looking at me funny. Look at your neighbor and tell him focus. Pay attention. Yeah, I got your attention now. So our hearts were created to do what? To worship, okay? But where our hearts were left unchecked, it means that we are able to worship anything. Are we together? God created our hearts to worship, but he did not force us to worship him. So it means that our hearts can fall in love with anything. And if our hearts are not in sync with God or loving God, it means even that which is beautiful, we can distort or we can pervert. Everything created by God is good, but it only remains good when the hearts are still focused on God. When hearts stray from God, it means that we will lose the very good in that thing that God has blessed us with. If our hearts are left unchecked, human beings can develop idols out of blessings. 
I know we don't talk about this in charismatic churches. They're idols. They're idols. We can create idols out of blessings. Our hearts were not meant to worship blessings. They were meant to worship the blesser. What is an idol? Anything given by God that takes the place of God. Anything given by God that takes the place of God. So our hearts must always be focused on God. Our default setting is the place of worship and prayer. Focused on God. Because no matter what we try to consume, there is only a place that God can fill in your heart. You see, people can have all the money in the world and commit suicide. Oh, come on, man. Because there's only a part, there's a certain part of your heart that only God can fill. So, so, we should strive to find contentment in God. That the ultimate prize should be our delight in God. People always say, delight yourself in God and he'll grant you the desires of your heart. Read the first part. Delight yourself in God. It means God must become our delight. And if God becomes our delight, then our delight to do, will be to do what God wants us to do. So of course he'll grant you the desires of your heart because your heart is fixed on him. But if you, your heart is not fixed on him, the Bible says you have not because you ask amiss. Because your intentions and your motives are not God. That's why it's important, beloved, that whatever we do in the kingdom, no matter the level of results, our result must always point back to our desire for God. Human beings are always looking for change and for breakthrough. But I need to tell you this, that God is more interested in a change of heart than a change of story. God is more interested in a change of heart than a change of scenery. If you change scenes without changing your heart, you have not changed the cycle. You will still be in the same situations over and over because God will move you only when your heart is changed. God will change the cycle when our hearts change. Because the place of change, where God measures his work or his purpose and place in our life, is not in our finances, it's not in our marriages, it's not in our businesses, it's in your heart. So, so the enemy has been working tirelessly to remove God from the hearts of men. That's why Jesus said, their mouths, oh my God, their mouths are with me, but their hearts are not with me. Because that remains a common challenge today. People have managed to swat Christianese. Father, I bind, I loose, I break, I tell, I combobulate, I whatever. But my heart... God's language is your heart, man. God's language is not your mouth. It's your heart. That's why our spirits do not testify. Why? Ooh. Our spirits don't testify with our mouths. They testify in our heart and cry out, Abba, Father. The love of God is not shed abroad in our pockets, in our mouths. It's shed abroad where? So the enemy has been working tirelessly to remove God from our lives. He's been working tirelessly to remove God from our hearts. And we see that the scripture starts us off in Judges chapter 6 by saying that Israel did evil in the sight of God. 
Because this remains a challenge even today, beloved. That our standards are not God. Our standards are people. You see, the problem is this. Doing evil in the sight of God only has one person who can judge you. That's God. And, and sometimes the issue is God may have seen wrong in you, but may not tell you immediately. And, and the problem is this, is that even in the spiritual things, you could be in a wrong place with God, but still look like you're in the right place in the world. Saul so had been fired 17 years ago, but didn't know. That his time was up. Saul didn't know that his heart had moved from God. For 17 years, he still looked like he was balling. For 17 years, he still looked like he was pimping. He still looked like he was somebody. But he didn't know that he had been fired. Because, beloved, our standard should never be people. Our standard should be the word of God. The church needs to come back. The world needs to come back to using scripture as its standard. We're in a dangerous time where people will say things like, I know the Bible says this, but. Or oh, you hear in church, can we be real? Because, beloved, we've come to a place, listen, I'm not saying that we are the standard, but we must remember the word of God is the standard. What it says we must do, whether we understand it or not, we've got to do it. Whether we believe or not, it's not your role to say, I don't believe this, so I won't do it. It doesn't exempt you from the consequences. It's like saying, I don't believe in gravity. Therefore, I'm going to fly. Let's see. Your belief matters not. Principles remain. Whether your belief simply allows you to benefit from a principle. Your belief does not change a principle. As my good friends say, Chilo, whether you believe or you don't believe, So Israel had lost sight of God. Tell your neighbor, don't lose sight of God. Israel had lost sight of God. You know, it's so easy in the times that we are to lose sight of God. It's so easy. Now you can't tell anybody nothing. Because Jesus is the only one allowed to tell you anything. Don't judge me. That's what you hear. Don't, don't judge me. Listen, we are not judges, but we're here to help sharpen you. And we're here to help sharpen you. That, that's the purpose of the church. And at times the church can lose its voice and witness wrong and have no voice to speak up at all. Because the enemy is working tirelessly to detach the standard that is the word of God, the truth. That is the word of God. And people begin to stray from the truth. They'll say things like, how do you marry without testing out? How, how do you enter a relationship without seeing compatibility? Compatible in hell. But, but you understand what I mean? Because truth is getting distorted. Standards are getting distorted. Christians are doing business, bribing, saying, there's nothing you can do. There's no other way. How else do you get a contract? Uka pia na contract you in. This is real stuff. Because you know what? We're in, we're in a world which is always testing our faith. Testing our belief. Testing you. 
So the children of Israel were, because they did evil in the sight of God, the Amalekites pounced on them and they, they were hidden in caves. And because of the murkiness of the world we are in, we are hiding our faith. We are hidden in caves. Afraid to come out. Afraid to speak the word. Afraid to declare who you are. You are a child of God. You are a child of God. You serve the lion of the tribe of Judah. They need to learn to respect you. They need to learn to recognize you. That when you appear, you come as the standard. Because the Bible says that when the enemy comes in like a flood, watch this now. The Lord does not allow anything to happen. The Lord does not remain the same. But the spirit of the Lord will raise a standard. Where are the believers who are ready to raise the standard? Where are the believers who are ready to stand and say, even though I made mistakes... Even though I've bowed to pressure, I'm ready to set the standard. I'm ready to display the standard. I'm ready to be different. I'm ready to be peculiar. I'm ready to show divinity. I'm ready to show that I am called by God. Don't place your rules on me. Don't place your culture on me. Don't place your ways on me. For the Bible says, do not conform to the patterns of this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of the mind. It's time for us to renew our minds. It's time for us to renew our minds. It's time for us to renew the way we do family. It's time for us to, re to renew the way we do church. To renew the way we do business. To renew the way we work. Somebody say amen. amen. Because there is an enemy trying to force you to hide your faith in a cave. I need somebody to let the devil know I'm proud of my faith. I'm not going to hide what I believe. I'm going to show it in the open. I'm not going to be like everybody else in society. Let them continue having sex anyway. I'm not going to be one of them. Let, con let them continue drinking all over the place. I'm not going to be one of them. Let them continue bribing and doing unethical things. I refuse to be one of them. Let them continue to squander and misappropriate resources. I refuse to be one of them. Somebody say amen. amen. When we lose sight of God, we become like the children of Israel. Defenseless and vulnerable. Because people are willing to throw God away for a blessing. They are willing to do anything for a blessing in inverted commas. And when you get a hold of that blessing, you realize that without God, there is no security. <laughs> Money without God is just fleeting. Marriage without God is calamity. Jobs without God are purposeless. Without God, it's going nowhere. So, so when we hold on to what we think is stability, breakthrough, money, marriage, whatever it is that you desire, and we forsake God, we realize that it has no security and has no stability. The children of Israel thought that they could continue growing and doing their work without God. But God said, okay, I'll step back. And all of a sudden, the children of, of, of the Midianites would overwhelm them every time they would plant. And then they began to realize that what they thought was a blessing was no blessing at all. Because the enemy always distorts the blessing and reduces our dependence. When we lose sight of God, listen to this, what should serve us begins to enslave us. This is the world we are in. People are saving money. What should save you has enslaved you. People are saving marriages. They will do anything. Anything. These days. Hey. Anything. For a marriage. Anything. 
anything. These days, you know, a few years ago, they just used to be a side chick. I remember dealing with an issue, and there were three side chicks. And they all knew they were side chicks. <laughs> and the one girl even said to me, she said, I don't mind being number three. I will wait. And people are even praying for, Father, break, break them, lose them, lose them, Lord. <laughs> what witchcraft? <laughs> I was going to say, can we be real? <laughs> I killed myself. But, but are you hearing me? Because when we lose sight of God, what should serve us begins to enslave us. When we lose sight of God, money that should work for you, you begin to work for it. You begin. Remember, the curse was that you will sweat. But God did not design you to live by labor. He designed you to live by favor. When we lose sight of God, the world has lost sight of God. We are slaves to sex. We're allowed to say it's church. Now, people are selling toothpaste. Toothpaste. And there's a girl. When I brush my teeth, are you understanding what I'm saying? Now, that stuff looks funny, but it's because the world has become enslaved by its sexual addiction. And, and, and now, the worst part is, I remember, as we go on, the standards just begin to break down. They begin to be worse and worse and worse. I, man, I grew up in a time where I remember listening to my first rap album with insults. I had to go to a friend's house five blocks away just in case my mother found me and beat me. Man, I grew up in a house where everything was a demon. <laughs> Second, <I'm> <laughs> You know, I, I pierced my ears some years ago. If you look carefully, the, the holes are still there. When I pierced my ears, my mother, eh, eh. See, it was a serious issue. And I remember that just to pierce my ears, I, I had to wait to go to university. I was a grown man. I was 19 years old, but still afraid of my mother. Now, 13, who's afraid of their mother? I had to pierce my ears. I pierced them because I wanted to go to school looking cool. I wanted to make an impression. When I arrived, they're like, hey, what's up? <laughs> what up? What it do? That was the time when we used to say, what it do? Some of you are having flashbacks <laughs> for shizzle. Productions <laughs> of just to pierce my ears, and I pierced it and removed the earring immediately and put a stick in there. But my mother, being the ego she was, <laughs> even though I was wearing a beanie over my head, was like. Pum -pum! Is that? <laughs> Two weeks later, I had an ear infection. <laughs> a very serious ear infection. I learned a lesson, but not a strong enough one, because later on, I pierced him again. But now, in society, who's not doing what? I'm not saying that it's wrong. All I'm saying is, where is the standard? Where is the standard? 
We've got to, re, re, I'm not here to say I'm judging you. But I'm saying, no matter whether there is judgment or not, there's always a standard. Standards do not mean judgment. If you fail grade seven, they put the standard. It's called 50%. You don't say, who judged me? Why are you judging me? <laughs> you failed. You understand what I'm saying? Standards always help us to progress in life. Somebody say amen. amen. Because when we lose sight of God, what should work us, work for us, begins to enslave us. People are enslaved because the enemy has an agenda. Every day, there are arrows of lust, fornication, adultery, debauchery, ruthlessness. You know, now our heroes on TV are even bad guys. Wes, copper belt. I've never heard anyone mention someone who is heroic, a lawyer, a doctor. They say, Nuria, umpondoria. Clayton, you need to do that thing for us. Eh? That was a good skit. I laughed. But, but, but that's what we celebrate here. We celebrate, you know, we even surround ourselves with people who are not of good character. Just because they give money. Just because the Bible says have nothing to do with those of wrong character. Have nothing. Nothing. That's the word of God. Because when we lose sight of God, what should serve us begins to enslave us. So God has to use frustration to prompt a need for salvation. God has to use frustration. Because you see, what amazes me here is that God watched them. Can I speak to some people here? My wife and I were having this discussion yesterday. And I realized this. It, is that, do you know, the story of the prodigal son, we always remember the welcoming father, right? But do you, never, do you ever realize that the father never followed him? He said, Mulekeni. Because God will never deliver you from what you still want. He can't deliver you from what you still desire. So the prodigal son wants to go. The father said, let him go. Some of us are struggling with things and we're saying, God changed me, but we are still desiring them. So God is saying, I can't do anything until you say, I'm done. You see, if you've ever met somebody who's had an addiction, they will never be delivered beyond their desire for change. Until they reached a point of frustration and realized that this is going nowhere. Until they decide the need for change. Many of us are in places where we are complaining to God. We are asking God for deliverance. But we are still doing what we want to do. God cannot deliver us beyond our frustration. He can't deliver us from what we still want. We can't be praying for marriage and still playing the field. We can't. We, we can't be praying for breakthrough financially. And still being frivolous with our money. We, we can't, you've got to choose what you want. Only, it's amazing that God only speaks when they say enough is enough. When they pray and cry out to God and say, God, we are tired of this. Frustration causes us to seek the face of God. That's why sometimes I thank God for the frustration that you go through. Yeah, I said it, I said it. Some of you, some, some people only pray in distress. And that, that surmounts your relationship with God. Lord, help me. Lord, do this. 
When the breakthrough comes, hey, that's how they went. When the breakthrough comes, you're like Zambian strikers, no show. Praying for my national team. I'm, I stopped watching them on Saturdays because they, they affect my faith. Affect my faith. We're praying for them. Frustration causes us to seek God. Sometimes it's what we go through that causes us to realize that there's only one thing that can help us. That's God. But what's interesting is God's response in this situation. He, he, he does not... He does not say, I got you. I think I'll aim here. <laughs> he, he, he simply says, have you forgotten what I took you through? Because, beloved, many times when we develop and we progress in life, we forget what God took us through. We forget the blessings that God has already delivered us. When you were crying for your rent, when you were crying for food, now just because you have a little something, you've already forgotten what God has done. I'm here to remind us, beloved, that we need to remember what God has done. This nation was founded on prayer. This nation was delivered on prayer. Our national anthem speaks of our dependence on God. Our constitution speaks of our dependence on God. But we've got to remember what he did for us so that we can live our lives going forward. Somebody say amen. Too many people are quick to forget what God has done for them. So God has to allow frustration to bring you to a point of remembrance. To bring you to a point of remembrance. He brings us to a point of remembrance. Because only when we remember the goodness of God. Does God then say I will restore your settings. I will restore your destiny. I will restore your future. I will restore your purpose. I will restore your family. I will restore your business. Today I came to speak to somebody. I don't know where you have left God out of your life. God is saying restore him back in your life God is saying recognize him once again and you will begin to see things change don't just pray for your marriage when your marriage is going down pray for your marriage even in the good times and say God I thank you for the good times I thank you for the great things Lord and I'm ready to see more things I don't know who I'm preaching to today but don't just pray to God when your business is going down restore the settings and say, God, I thank you when you gave me money just to register my business. I thank you when you gave me money for my first contract. I thank you when you gave me money for the little things. Now I'm going to continue remembering you in everything that I do. I don't know who I'm preaching to here in this place. But I need somebody to believe God. I say, God, I thank you for that little first job you gave me when my salary was 1,500 kwacha. And I didn't know how I was going to get through her, but now I'm earning a little something. I'm not going to forget you, God. I'm not going to forget you, God. I'm not going to forget you, God. I will display my confidence in you. I will display my trust in you. I will display my belief in you. Am I preaching to somebody in this place? It's time to restore the settings. Let's bring God back into our lives. Let's bring God back into our families. Let's bring God back into the church. Let's bring God back into the ministry. Let's bring God back into everything that we do. Somebody say amen. amen. Israel was defeated because they lost sight of God. We represent by always keeping our eyes fixed on God. Fixed on God. The author. And the perfecter of our faith. I came to let you know, God, as long as your eyes are fixed on him, he will perfect your situation. I don't know what I'm preaching to. He will perfect your situation. 
Too many of us have lost sight of God. We think it's our, 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 our connections that got us this far. But God says, I took you from Egypt. I took you from this situation. I delivered you from the hands of the Amorites and the Amalekites. I placed you in this land. Beloved, don't take, uh, uh, don't take credit for what God has given you by grace. Everything you are is by the grace of God. Paul said this, I am what I am by the grace of God. I am in the job I am by the grace of God. I'm in the family I am by the grace of God. I drive the car I drive by the grace of God. I live where I live by the grace of God. I am positioned where I'm positioned by the grace of God. My business has progressed not because of my connections, but by the grace of God. Everything is by the grace of God. I wish I had a few people in this place who are ready to say, God, I thank you for your grace. I thank you for your your grace I thank you for your grace when I didn't deserve it you made it happen for me when I didn't believe you still did it for me because we are what we are by the grace everything is by the grace we need to restore this that the world needs to start looking back to God by the grace of God we need to start looking back to what God has done for us. I like what happens here. And I'll end with this. He picks Gideon all of a sudden. Because the deliverer is never from outside. The deliverer is always within. This is something and a principle we must learn even in our economy and in our country. Deliverance is always within. In the church, deliverance is always within. In your life, deliverance is never external. It's within. Your deliverance is in you. Your deliverance. So this thing of people trying to, trying to manipulate you that you need them. If God has said yes, no man can say no. No man can stop you if God is on your side. Because your deliverance is within. And God picks Gideon. Gideon. Who, who is suddenly pressing wine or pressing wheat in a threshing floor. The threshing floor, sorry, in a wine press. He's pressing wheat in a wine press. The, the, the wheat is not meant to be pressed in the wine press. There's a, there's a place for that. Because for some reason, when the enemy takes over our lives and our society, our lives become dysfunctional. And not only do they become dysfunctional, we normalize dysfunction. You know, you know the problem is that if, if, if you are in a place, an environment of dysfunction for so long, you become used to it. Can I preach to a few people? How many of you have had something wrong in your house? Like maybe the door doesn't open the way it should, but you don't fix it. And you only remember to fix it when you have guests coming. Because there's something about living in dysfunction for so long that it becomes normal. Your TV doesn't work the way it should. You even know how to press the button. Instead of fixing it, you live with it. Oh man, I'm preaching here. Instead of fixing it, you live with it. But God uses dysfunction to reveal your function. He uses dysfunction to show his true function. Uh, so I came to preach to somebody here that God is about to use your dysfunction and deliver you from that dysfunction to represent to the world that he is a delivering God, that he is a changing God, that he's about to lift his people, that he can turn the story around, that your story will not remain the same, that God can move you from a, from a zero to a hero, that God can move you from nothing to something, that God can move you from broke to rich, that God can move you from unemployed to employed from barren to fruitful from whatever you are right now to where God wants you to be I came to declare over somebody's life God is about to change your story to represent to the world that he is still God that he's going to deliver you that he's going to change you he says something to Gideon he says to Gideon uh, you alone will defeat the Midianites as one man then Gideon says this to God he says alright God if you're being for real then what 
what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring a sacrifice to you and wait for me until I come back. And the angel of the Lord says something amazing. He says, you will come back. I came to prophesy to somebody, you are about to come back. You are about to bounce back. You are about to resurrect. You are about to be back in your position. They look down on you because you trusted God and you didn't bribe anybody in your business. But you are about to bounce back. They trusted you. God trusted you. And he's about to cause you to bounce back. I'm preaching to somebody here. You didn't go through marriage looking for sugar daddies or blessers. Looking for girls or hoochies. You decided to trust God. I'm preaching to somebody in this place. And God is about to make you bounce back. I'm preaching to somebody in this place. You are the only one in your business that has decided to trust God. Everybody at work is doing an ethical thing but you have stood on the word that the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run to it and they are safe. I prophesy your safety in 2018. You will bounce back. Your business will bounce back. Your marriage will bounce back. Your career will bounce back. Your life will bounce back because when you trust God it doesn't matter where you are God will restore your settings and cause you to bounce back no matter how the enemy pushes you down your default setting is to bounce back even through the heat you will bounce back in depression you will bounce back let them fire you you will bounce back let them oppress you you will bounce back may the grace be on you like Joseph that even though they threw you in the prison how ah, you will bounce back I'm preaching to somebody this as long as you trust God you will bounce back I said you will bounce back it doesn't matter where you are as long as we can trust God it may look like you are going away but you will bounce back and you are like Gideon right now nobody is even paying you attention but because you have trusted God you will bounce back I said you will bounce back you will bounce back you didn't have to kiss up to anybody in your workplace but you chose to trust God and I declare you will bounce back you will bounce back as long as we do it God's way I believe that we're in a season where those who trust God are about to be set up for distinction. Oh man. Because the world has created systems that say you cannot do it the Christian way. You, you cannot marry the Christian way. You cannot do business the Christian way. You cannot do marriage the Christian way. You can't. That's what the world system says. You can't. You can't. I've heard men talk crazy things. They say, Amune, you need somebody besides Satana. Stop it. And let me tell you something. These are not men in the world. Oh, man. These are men in church. This stuff is in church. It's not in, we're busy. You see, the problem is this. The church, the church has been so blinded by the blessing that they're not looking at the state of its people. <laughs> because this is what happened to the, mid, to the Israelites. The blessing blinded them from God. And that's the church today. A blessing you immediately declare somebody's salvation by the blessing. That blessing, he must be saved, must be born again. Are you sure? I, I was saying this to Mansa the other day, we were driving. I said, do you know, accuracy of prophecy is no sign that God is with you. Not at all. Balaam prophesied accurately. But had backslidden. Eli prophesied. 
In fact, it was Eli who answered the prayer of Hannah. Eli who had been discarded by God because God will still answer a prayer of faith irrespective of the vessel. He will answer. Agreement is a principle. If we agree, it doesn't say if two agree, but they must both be born again. He says if two agree. But let's not be blinded by the blessings that we miss the blesser. Church today is all about results. Results, results, results. Beloved, what will get you into heaven is not results. It's relationship. Because Jesus will say, I did not know you. Irrespective of the results you had, I did not know you. Let people know God through you. Let people know God through you. Be a standard. Some of you don't even know that the world is watching you and measuring your standard of faith and saying that person is my benchmark. You don't even know it. You don't even know it. And they're just watching you. Some months back, some months back, I had a friend in my office call me and just called me and said, you know what? I've been watching you from Wow. And I just want to let you know that you, you inspire me, you encourage me, and you push me. So the world is watching you. But you cannot lose sight of God. Keep focused on God. Because if you lose sight of God, the world will overwhelm you. <coughs> Keep sight on God. Keep your eyes fixed on God. As long as Peter looked at God, he was afloat. As long as he looked away from God, he sunk. Let that principle stick in your mind. Keep your eyes fixed on God. Don't come to church this week and miss three weeks and expect a miracle in week four. Stick to God. Stick to God. Trust God. I can let you down, but God will never let you down. I may not answer the phone, but God will answer you. Eyes must be fixed on God. Stand your feet. I want to declare for somebody, anybody in a dysfunctional state right now, I pray for you that may God deliver you from that state of dysfunction. And may He use you. I'm talking to you right now. You could be in a dysfunctional marriage. I pray for you. I pray for you. May God use your marriage and turn your story around. Your story will minister to people. One of my favorite marriage, marriage counselors, I listen to marriage sermons a lot, is this, this guy, couple on television called Jimmy and Karen Evans. Who, who knows Jimmy and Karen? I love Jimmy and Karen. But Jimmy and Karen, their entire ministry talks about their dysfunction and how God turned their dysfunction into function. And it gave them true function. So I, I know where you are looks dysfunctional. But God is about to turn that dysfunction. And give you a real function. He's going to make you functional. Lift up your hands wherever you are. I want you to take 30 seconds and speak to God and say, Lord, change my story. Lift me up from this situation. Come on, go ahead. Come on, open up your mouth. Open up your mouth. Open up your mouth and begin to pray. Kantala Bokosha. Lebra